Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has faced a series of reports about his financial arrangements in recent weeks. It started with a ProPublica investigation, which revealed that he did not disclose that for years he took expensive vacations as a gift from conservative billionaire Harlan Crow. Subsequently, it was reported that Crow also owned the house Thomas's mother lives in rent-free. We wanted to tease out the elements that are raised by all of this and why they matter. Thomas was legally allowed to exclude certain things provided by Crow from his disclosure forms, like the frequent trips to a vacation home. But other exclusions were a violation of the law, such as the years of private airplane and yacht travel and the sale of his mother's home to Crow. Thomas quietly acknowledged this by amending his forms, though he says publicly that he did nothing wrong because the two have been longtime friends. At issue is whether any Supreme Court justice should be so indebted to any one person and whether, despite what a justice says, the cozy relationship affects the court's ability to act impartially. There aren't many rules in place to determine the answers. It's up to the justices to police themselves, unlike other branches of government. For example, if a member of Congress is offered a painting valued at $1,000 from an acquaintance, they're not allowed to accept it. Supreme Court justices can't as long as the member believes there wasn't an ulterior motive behind the gift. However, justices do not have to get approval from any group or justify their rationale for the motive in any way on financial disclosure forms. A deeper look at Clarence Thomas's finances only raises more questions. The Washington Post reports for the past two decades, Justice Thomas has reported hundreds of thousands of dollars in income from a real estate firm that no longer exists. The company, Ginger limited partnership started by his wife and his family has reportedly not existed since 2006. The family has since created a separate firm called Ginger Holdings, but according to the Post, Justice Thomas has not mentioned it on any disclosure forms. Let's bring in Ash Ahmed. He is an associate professor of law at Columbia Law School. Ash, let's roll this back a lot here. Why is it important for judges to follow a code of conduct at whatever level they exist? Um, thanks, John. I'm happy to be here. Centrally, we have codes of conduct in place for judges, um, mainly to keep them impartial, as you had mentioned, in particular in concrete disputes. The issue um, about the appearance of corruption or gifts with the Supreme Court is that the Supreme Court doesn't simply decide particular disputes, they basically declare law. So they declare, um, they establish guidelines for how unions can organize or the sorts of individual civil rights we have or corporates, corporate rights. So any concern we have about impartiality for lower judges is just amplified with the Supreme Court. And yet the Supreme Court doesn't have the same kinds of rules that govern it uh, as judges at lower levels. Yes, absolutely. In fact, the Supreme Court um, is basically responsible for its own um, internal code management. And really, there don't exist specific guidelines for Supreme Court um, conduct. Um, senators and other representatives have been pushing for the um, legislation or the um, institution of some, but mainly the Supreme Court um, is left to its own devices. Um, they seem to think that um, internal norms and culture will do the job. Well, internal norms and culture have uh, been much in discussion in American life uh, for the last many years. And, and that leads me to my next question. So we've already covered the territory of what effect this may or may not have on a particular justice. How about that larger question of the court's role in American life, um, the standing the court has among the American public to, to make decisions that some people might not like? Do individual justices have an obligation to the institution that is distinct from this question of whether they might or might not be influenced by lavish gifts or whatever from a particular person? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Concerns about the Supreme Court's legitimacy are constantly popping up in the news. And the Supreme Court has shown a willingness to sort of go after institutional threats or problems that they think um, endangered the court's credibility. I should say, contrast the immediacy with which Justice Roberts instituted a um, DOJ 
invest help sort of usher in a DOJ investigation of the leak of the Dobbs opinion in the months before with the kind of deafening silence we have from the court in the wake of something that seems actually much more troubling um, when we think about impartiality. Um, the, you know, if you look at Supreme Court justices, and this applies to both ends of the political spectrum on the Supreme Court, um, folks are, um, they're, they're constantly on speaking junkets, have huge book deals. Um, many are close, especially on the conservative side, to huge corporate interests. Um, this, I mean, this is sort of symptomatic of American society and kind of like elite friendships as a general matter, but it becomes really troubling when you think about an institution that really relies on credibility and public faith um, to function. So uh, that leads me to this question, which, as you mentioned, John, uh, um, Chief Justice John Roberts moved very quickly when the court's reputation was at issue when a, when a uh, decision was leaked on Roe. But let's yeah. say he wanted to spring into quick action. Can anyone tell another justice what to do, whether it's the chief justice or the president or Congress? Who has actual authority to get a chief justice or to get another an associate justice to do something if they don't want to? Yeah, so the, so the chief justice can't make Justice Thomas do anything. Um, I mean, the chief justice is known as primus santa paris, right? He's a first among equals. He doesn't have any sort of enforcement authority. The single tool that we, the really the major single tool we have is impeachment. There's only been one justice impeached in the history of the Supreme Court, Samuel Chase in 1805, and he wasn't removed. We just don't impeach judges, let alone Supreme Court justices. Um, all of this would not be that troubling, John, if the Supreme Court weren't as powerful as it is. Um, but we think about it as a political prize, which it is, just like we think about Congress or the presidency. So the idea, why are we so troubled when a Supreme Court justice seems to be um, getting cushy real estate deals or lodging? Um, we're troubled because we know that the Supreme Court isn't simply deciding a bankruptcy case. It's deciding what bankruptcy law will look like. It isn't simply deciding a civil, um, a particular civil rights dispute. It's deciding what all of our collective rights are. So again, this leads us to more fundamental questions about if we can't really discipline this institution, do we want them to be as powerful as they are? Right, there was a... Big debate about shared powers some number of years ago on that very question. Ashram, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you.